It is Sunday, September the 29th, 2019. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff and Georgia. On today's show, the disaster at Greenwood. It's probably the worst act of racial violence in American history, certainly in the 20th century. In terms of casualties, we're going to dive into how it happened, why it happened, if it has anything to tell us about today's struggle for racial equality. But of course, before I get to all that, just a brief reminder that this show, like all of these shows, is brought to you by listeners like you. Listeners who go to patreon.com slash distant peasant become recurring donors for as little as one dollar a month. Thank you to each and every one of my patrons. There's also a PayPal link at paypal.me slash distant peasant where you can put money, money that I will use to pay my bills. Please and thank you. Enough with all that. Going a bit long today, so let's get to it. I often feel a little bit self-conscious about my identity when writing these shows, more so when I write about the history of racism and white supremacy in America. I don't go proclaiming it at the top of the show every time, but I'm a boring, straight, cis male, and I'm a white southerner, and I'd much rather be seen as clever or wise, charming, interesting, talented, even handsome, than white, but there is no use in denying who you are, try as one might like to live life without valuing whiteness, it's always there. It makes a big difference in America, how you're seen, what opportunities are likely to be available to you, what connections and family you're able to draw upon, where you're more likely to live, and how the state, particularly its police forces, interact with you. One of the United States of America's most lasting and foundational principles, perhaps the longest lasting, has been white supremacy. And our society and its values, institutions, still reflect this. Incidentally, history and politics have been no different. Stories told by white voices intended for the ears of other white people, reflecting a white point of view. In my own small way, perhaps I contribute to this problem. It's a fair criticism. Who am I to stand against the system and society that holds me up? Just another white person. Speaking on history from a wide point of view, and this one without the flimsy shielding of a PhD or even some graduate school credits. Hell, I don't even have a bachelor's in history. I'm only as expert as I can muster myself to be, and forever burdened by my perspective to boot. That's the truth. And yet here I am, and not just because I've decided to press on in spite of having good reasons not to. There are a few excuses related to production and philosophy I could make in answer to these objections, but the most important answer I have to this idea is that it's really important to me that these stories aren't told by only non-white voices, and I refuse to accept the history crafted for people like me, an easy story of slow and steady progress on race, led by the efforts of benevolent white progressives, and I want to stand with others who do the same. One other reason is a little cruder, <laughs> because it's a white people like Ben Shapiro. With all due apologies, here he is in September 2017, quoted directly. I've lightly restitched this for brevity and clarity. Quote, now listen, you'd be a fool not to acknowledge, or a liar, not to acknowledge the history of racism in America. Everybody acknowledges that. If you have half a brain, of course. Slavery, Jim Crow, awful. Evil treatment at the hands of awful, evil people. We all acknowledge this. We all acknowledge the collective sin of the United States in promulgating this, and the individual sins, more importantly, of the people who actually promulgated this stuff. We all get that. But that's not what we're talking about. Now we're talking about now. Because I wasn't born when Jim Crow was in place. I wasn't an adult when Jim Crow was in place. I know that I'm not a racist, and I know I haven't acted in a racist manner, and I would bet you money that the people in this room haven't acted in a racist manner, that they haven't held slaves or voted for Jim Crow. I will bet you money that's the case. 
You cannot fix past injustices with current injustices. The only way to fix past injustices is with individual freedom. That's it. The idea that black people in the United States are disproportionately poor because America is racist, that's just not true. At least not in terms of America's racism today, keeping black people down. It's just not the case. End quote. Just a bit more. He goes on later. Quote, that means in a free country, if you fail, it's probably your own fault. If it is somebody else's fault, if somebody else is actually trying to throw up obstacles in front of you in a way that is unjust and bigoted, point out the specific instance so we can all side with you. We all want to be on the same side. We all want to help out. When somebody is a racist and trying to stop you, we all want to sound off and stop that too. But you feeling insulted and then whining about it and then suggesting that you're a victim without evidence. And that I have victimized you because I won't accept your victimhood. This makes the country a worse place. Okay, here are three rules that you need to fulfill as a person before you can start complaining about your life failures being the result of somebody else's actions. Number one, you need to finish high school. Number two, you need to get married before you have babies. Number three, you need to get a job. That's it. You do those things, you will not be permanently poor in the United States of America. End quote. All of that. Bullshit. The end, standard pull yourself up rhetoric, of course, but it's context within a larger section about race in this country is telling. I have long heard this rhetoric. It has been around as long as I can remember. An endless exhortation to minorities, black people in particular in America, to embrace the politics of respectability, self-improvement, self-sufficiency, Protestant values, work ethic. If they want to achieve true equality with white people. Don't bother agitating for awareness of your historic victimhood or demanding justice. And don't work against the white establishment's mechanisms directly. Just work hard on yourselves. Keep your heads down. Go to school. Don't be so uppity. They are sometimes bold enough to say. This infuriates me for a lot of reasons. I remain unconvinced that American capitalism can ever really be truly racially egalitarian, but even granting that theoretical scenario, you still got all the same problems of endless economic growth based on finite resources and increasingly severe environmental effects and a system that still fundamentally exploits the working class not to fulfill human need, but to generate maximum profits. And that's one big reason that pisses me off. And that sort of dirty socialist talk might be popular with some of you. It doesn't hold sway over everyone, of course. A better reason might be a simpler one. We fucking did that shit already. In the decades after the United States Civil War, many black people in America were lucky enough to be able to take Ben Shapiro's advice. Much the same advice, contemporary progressive reformers in early 20th century America. The children and grandchildren of slaves, they went to school, they built businesses, they became doctors, lawyers, accountants. They lived in fine, respectable Victorian homes, with their churches and schools well attended in a segregated world. No different than the white people across the train tracks. Except one, of course, no political power whatsoever. And if you ask me, it's that fact that made all the difference. A fact based upon the race of the people involved. A fact with its origins in this nation's foundation as a white supremacist society. And you know, every now and then in a society like that, an event occurs in history that kind of serves as a microcosm. A tiny event that mirrors the larger dynamics of the situation so well it deserves close examination. Now, this is such a story. The story of Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma and of Black Wall Street, and of why there is no such thing anymore. In 1905, Booker T. Washington, also known as the Great Accommodator, my friend of the show, W.E.B. Du Bois, visited Greenwood a year before its official incorporation as a town. I don't want to be too hard on Booker T. Washington, he was a great man who cared for both his people and all people. And his legacy as an accommodationist is complicated by his secret agitations against Jim Crow, segregation, 
and legalized white supremacy. But to give you just a little taste of his vision, from Emmett J. Scott and Lyman Beatrice Stowe's Booker T. Washington, Builder of a Civilization, published 1916, quote, He established the Greenwood Village Improvement Association for the little community which has grown up around the school. Taxes are collected from the property holders, as well as the renters for the upkeep of the roads, bridges, and fences. A park in the center of the village, which was introduced in emulation of the typical New England village just as in New England, also this central park, or green, is surrounded by a number of churches. An elective board of control presides over this village, settles disputes, keeps the community in good repair, morally and spiritually, as well as physically. On the Monday immediately following the close of a regular school term, a town meeting is held, at which reports are read and discussed, covering every phase of the life of the community. Mr. Washington particularly enjoyed presiding at these meetings because they demonstrated what the people of his race could accomplish under a favorable and stimulating environment. He was always contrived to have the meetings followed by simple refreshments and a social hour, end quote. You see, it was Booker G. Washington who coined the term Black Wall Street, or more commonly in the parlance of the times, it was usually called Negro Wall Street, Locally, Little Africa. It also had worse names that I won't bother giving you. It was a town within a town, really, in Tulsa. Most white folk didn't consider it a part of Tulsa proper. But on the eve of the massacre, Memorial Day weekend, 1921, Tulsa had gone in the space of a generation from a small frontier town to the oil capital of the world. Oklahoma received statehood in 1907, and Tulsa had about 7,000 people in it when that happened. Just 14 years later, over 100,000 people lived in Tulsa. It was a modern city of industry, banking, and culture. It had the richest per capita income of any place on earth. Greenwood developed into a mirror image of Tulsa, more or less. One of the few areas where black people could earn and spend money freely within the confines of the area. And it too developed into a modern city, with lawyers, doctors, dentists, shops, even a fine hotel that catered to black people. A big deal in those days. Mary Parrish came to Greenwood. She was a black woman and a teacher in 1918 from Rochester, New York. Quote, I heard of the town since girlhood and the many opportunities to make money. But I came because of the wonderful cooperation I observed among our people especially among our businessmen and women. Every face seemed to wear a smile. After spending years of struggling and sacrifice, people had begun to look upon Tulsa as the Negro metropolis of the Southwest. Going north to Archer Street for two or more blocks, one could see nothing but Negro businesses. Going east, you would behold Greenwood Avenue, the Negro's Wall Street. There were homes of beauty and splendor and the schools and churches were well attended. It was a city within a city, end quote. Don Ross, the Oklahoma State representative who pushed hard to get his state to recognize this horrific event we'll talk about, put it well when he said at the Times, quote, when they spoke of blacks, blacks were to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And they did. They did. The money in my community didn't turn over the traditional three or four times. It turned over eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. There were legitimate and illegitimate monies to be made that fueled that economy. My community was the Vegas of the twenties. It was roaring. End quote. I've actually seen some estimates that the average dollar spent in Greenwood at the time actually passed through 19 different black hands before a white hand got around to grabbing it. It was a great embrace of spending locally and building up the prosperity of Greenwood. And it was helped along by the fact that even if one disagreed with that, if you were black, there was virtually nowhere else your money was any good. But for all the splendor of some of the homes and professional practices of Greenwood, it's important not to get caught up in this narrative of material prosperity. It was generally a poorer section of town for the vast majority of its residents. And with nearly all the good working class jobs in the oil and manufacturing fields closed off to them, 
Most of the residents of Greenwood took more menial, difficult, and poorly compensated jobs. Dishwashers, janitors, porters, or day laborers, domestic workers. To make matters worse, we're coming off the end of World War I, when many of the city's black residents who could afford to had bought war bonds. The war effort had been pitched in the name of democracy, and though there be a mountain of bullshit buried in those few words, some people actually did take it seriously, and among some of those people were black veterans, forced to fight in segregated units given the worst and hardest duties, and who kicked a lot of ass. For example, take the 369th Infantry Regiment, who was sent to the desperate French to help hold fast just west of the Argonne Forest, which they did for over a month. Then, with only a brief rest, they were placed smack in the middle of a German offensive, which they withstood, and then participated in the counteroffensive that drove the Germans from their trenches. They were known as the Harlem Hellfighters by their German opponents, men of bronze by their French comrades. They saw more combat action than any American unit in the entirety of World War I, and more casualties. And they and others like them returned to a world that had not only failed to improve, but was actively growing more hostile to them. The nadir of American race relations, as historian Rayford Logan would have put it, did put it. Scientific racism and phrenology, of course, are on the rise. The second Ku Klux Klan was reestablished in 1915. Back in 1911, Oklahoma had effectively ended voting by African Americans statewide, and though overturned four years later, other methods would be employed post-haste to continue this effort. Lynchings, always a plague in Oklahoma and states like them among frontier towns, were, believe it or not, not really a racial thing at first. Even though the first African Americans began arriving in the late 1800s. Before 1911, lots of different outlaws, horse, cattle thieves, and real, imagined, were lynched in Oklahoma and the vast majority of them involved white victims dying at the hands of white mobs. But after 1911, all the lynching victims across the state, save one, were African American. Tulsa's Klan membership on the eve of the massacre was probably in the low thousands of dues-paying members, and set to skyrocket over the coming years. And across the nation in 1919, things were so bad that the whole season is just called... Red Summer, when demobilized veterans of different races began competing for jobs and a place in the world. Hundreds of people were killed in a series of attacks nationally that year, the vast majority of which involved white mobs attacking African Americans. What's worse, the violence itself grew more barbarous at this time. For example, rather than simply hanging them, White mobs began burning black people alive, tied to stakes. This began to be employed in some places. It happened at least 11 times across the nation in the year after World War I. As Du Bois put it, who once lectured in Tulsa, quote, We return from the slavery of uniform which the world's madness demanded us to don, to the freedom of civil garb. We stand again to look upon America squarely in the face and call a spade a spade. We sing, this country of ours, despite all its better souls have done and dreamed, is yet a shameful land. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. End quote. All this just to say, things were bad and getting worse, which is an important bubble to burst regarding popular depictions of the history of race in America. We used to have slavery. Now we don't. Black people used to not be able to vote. Now they mostly can. It can be easy to imagine that things have gotten slightly better over time, gradually perhaps, but steadily. And though there's always much work to be done, there is always hope if we press on as we have. A tidy story, quite wrong. Progress in this country has come in fits and starts, and at many different points the cause of civil rights and racial egalitarianism has made great strides forward, only to make ever greater strides backward. These points are writ large and small across American history, and one of the biggest little ones ever is about to happen. In 
to Greenwood. The immediate catalyst for the massacre was a thing that didn't happen in a newspaper article that doesn't exist anymore. On May 30th, 1921, Dick Rowland was a shoe shiner in downtown Tulsa, and if he wanted to go to the bathroom, he had to be careful about it. There was a restroom in the building where he worked, and he was not permitted to use it, it being for whites only. He was permitted to use the colored restrooms at the top of the nearby Drexel building, and so he took an elevator up, which was operated by a young white woman of similar age to him, Sarah Page. What happened next during that elevator ride isn't known for sure. They probably did know each other, at least by sight. He rode the elevator regularly, she operated the elevator regularly, and most accounts are that Dick tripped or stumbled during the ride somehow. It's also speculated that perhaps they had a mild dispute, maybe even a lover's quarrel, a dangerous taboo of the day, but not impossible to imagine. But in any case, Dick probably reached out and grabbed her arm for some reason, and Sarah screamed. A clerk heard and called the police, and said he found Sarah in a distraught state, thinking she had been assaulted, he said, though apparently not needing any damn woman to tell him that, no doubt colored by his own prejudices, racism and sexism both. Now, the police came and questioned Sarah, and no documents relating to that event or any account by her has ever been found. The biggest single piece of evidence we have that whatever happened between the two almost certainly no assault or crime of any kind was committed. Additionally, all who knew Dick at the time and in the years since have attested similarly, Dick Rowland would never rape anyone. And he was somewhat well known throughout the city as a shoeshine among that town's lawyers and businessmen and whatnot. Sarah Page declined to press charges. Dick was arrested the following day anyway. But the bigger spark was what happened in the papers. Radio had not made its way to Tulsa yet, though the telegraph and telephone have. Newspapers are therefore still incredibly important and widely read. The Tulsa Tribune ran an article twice about all this, once in a morning and once in an evening printing. The first is headlined, quote, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator, end quote. It describes Sarah as an orphan, false, who was working the elevator to pay for college, also false, and that she was covered in scratches with torn clothing. Can you believe it? False. There was another article, or perhaps an editorializing on the incident, entitled or subtitled something like, quote, to lynch Negro tonight, end quote. Now, we don't know the exact title because all copies of that paper's edition were destroyed. Even the microfilm page mysteriously missing. But we do know from numerous recollections and sources, both white and black, that an editorial appeared that straight up encouraged, or at least stated plainly, that the town was going to lynch this young man. If you look into this, I would advise you not to be deceived by those who would cast doubt upon this editorial's existence. This is one of the worst things about the material in this whole affair. This editorial almost certainly did exist, and time is cruel enough to historians. It destroys much that we wish we still had in our never-ending quest to understand what happened and why. This is the way of the world. Crueler still is the deliberate suppression of history and its subsequent rewriting. There will be more of this to come, I assure you. Anyway, regardless of the exact truth of what happened in that elevator, in the end, Dick Rowland would leave town. All charges against him dropped. Sarah Page will drop out of history entirely. Neither were killed during the rioting, or had much at all to do with the massacre. Now, while Dick was in custody, a group of African Americans showed up to protect him from a gathering white mob at the courthouse. Both of these groups had armed members among them. Now, the black folks claimed the sheriff had welcomed their presence to their faces, encouraging them to come. The sheriff denied this and told them to go away, but if I had to put money on it, I'd say the sheriff is lying, likely to save face in the eyes of the white community, some of whom were gathering and threatening to lynch a man in his custody. One white man exchanged words with a black man and then tried to disarm that black man, 
A shot rang out. It may have been an accident, perhaps fired as a warning, or even fired with malice aforethought. However it happened, this bullet triggered a hail of more bullets and the first casualties of the massacre occurred. Mary Parrish described it thus, quote, The evening being a pleasant one, my little girl had not retired but was watching the people from the window. Occasionally she would call to me, Mother, look at the cars full of people. I would reply, Baby, do not disturb me when I read. Finally, she said, Mother, I see men with guns. Then I ran to the window and looked out. There I saw many people gathered in little squads, talking excitedly. Going downstairs to the street, I was told of the threatened lynching and that some of our group were going to give added protection to the boy. I am told that this little bunch of black men marched up to the jail, where there were already over 500 white men gathered, and that this number soon swelled to over a thousand. Someone fired a stray shot, and to use the expression of June Grant, all hell broke loose, end quote. So a rolling gun battle broke out between these two and the black contingent was driven back towards Greenwood. And the white mob began dispersing somewhat to begin looting guns and ammunition from storefronts. The atmosphere at the courthouse was festive as 500 special deputies were sworn in. The only real requirement to be a deputy was that one was white. Most of these people were not even asked their names or addresses. They were clan deputies, really. The National Guard didn't begin to organize until around 11 p.m., and they began setting up posts in white districts adjacent to Greenwood and began the systematic internment of every black person in Tulsa into what were called detention centers, or sometimes concentration camps. Planes began to take off and soar over Greenwood, First for reconnaissance or just to take rifle pot shots. But by 1 a.m., the first fires had broken out. Firefighters who arrived to fight the blazes were turned away at gunpoint, according to first-hand accounts. And by 4 a.m., over two dozen black-owned businesses were ablaze. Now, I want to pause here to emphasize one point that often gets underplayed in all this in the literature. Now, Greenwood, basically all of it will be burnt to the ground before all this is over. But no group of arsonists with half a brain burns down a building before they check it for valuables. Describing the events here as a massacre and not a riot is far more accurate. But both of these words leave out the systematic stripping of wealth in Greenwood. At a time of economic contraction in the city after the war, even though that contraction would always harm black people more than white people, Greenwood had built up its middle and professional classes over a couple decades and still had the material prosperity to show for it. No more of that. From the pocket money of any and every black person they came across to the fine pianos and furniture of Greenwood Avenue proper, the wealth of Greenwood would be systematically stripped from every black person and business the white mob could get its hands on. Those airplanes I mentioned earlier weren't just used for reconnaissance or rifle shots, of course. And though they were privately owned aircraft, it is certain that law enforcement were aboard at least some of them. In addition to firing down at fleeing and injured residents, many accounts reference the dropping of bombs. Now, whether they dropped nitroglycerin or some other explosive concoction can't be substantiated, which isn't to say it didn't happen. More likely were reports of burning turpentine balls, Molotov cocktail type things, other kinds of fire bombs. Certainly lots of buildings burned. And we have no photographic evidence of damage consistent with explosion. But these are all details, really. Those planes were deadly tools of the white mob who used them to great effect, sadistic delight, and who dropped bombs on black neighborhoods. In that black neighborhood, by the way, Mount Zion Baptist Church was a symbol of pride. It was completed just a few weeks prior to the riot. 
It was newer and nicer than many a white church in town, perhaps the nicest church in Tulsa. Burnt to the ground, allegedly because ammunition was stored in the basement. There almost certainly wasn't any ammunition down there, but even had there been, this was but a convenient fig leaf for white resentment of black wealth. The church was burned because it was too nice, and it was in a blacked part of the city. Anyway, as twilight hours turned to morning, thousands of black people fled the city, often in their nightgowns and pajamas. Machine guns rained bullets down upon their neighborhoods. Eyewitness accounts report even mothers with small children pursued and gunned down. Two hospitals existed for black people in Tulsa prior to the riot, both destroyed. Makeshift replacements were dispersed and the black residents murdered or placed into detention. And these concentration camps were no place to receive reliable medical attention. J.C. Latimer survived the riot, quote, We came out after several shots were fired into the house by the mob. Two or three whites thrust guns in each man's face inside and then took him downstairs. As I neared the bottom of the steps, I was met by a man who very unkindly treated me. Seeing a man with hands raised, he came up to the blind side and struck me in the jaw, after which I was questioned and my money taken. The worst thing of all was being humiliated before little boys between the ages of 12 and 16 years, knowing these youngsters would grow up to try the same thing when they matured that others tried, but with less success, I am hoping." End quote. Here's another account, tragic tale of playing by the rules, and it meaning nothing at all. Quote, Fanny was our laundress. She lived in Greenwood with an ancient uncle who'd been a messenger in the bank for 20 years. They knew there was trouble, of course, but the mob had missed them so far. Uncle Zack had never been late to the bank, and he trusted white folks. He thought maybe if he put on his uniform and they saw it, he put it on and started out to work. Someone shot him at the corner. Fanny could see him lying there. She didn't dare go out and get him. Mob was so close. End quote. Even the most elite of the elite were not safe. Dr. A.C. Jackson was one of the finest surgeons of the era of any race in the United States. He was then 40 years old, living in Tulsa, an incredibly gentle and mild-mannered gentleman. He may have been murdered by a group of half a dozen or so men during the waning hours of the riot though other accounts describe him killed at the hands of a white teenager shot as his hands were above his head. He did not die instantly. He was taken to a detention center where he bled to death for lack of medical attention. Martial law wasn't declared until 11.29 a.m. the next day. An order began to be restored, such as it was. This order was by no means benevolent. Now, white rioters were no match for such force that was organized, so, of course, they melted away. And the National Guard began busying itself shooting at or detaining black people. By the end of the day, virtually every black person in Tulsa was either killed, wounded, fled, arrested, or placed into a concentration camp. The exact number of dead and wounded is difficult to ascertain, though people have tried over the years. The Red Cross, the only organization the city of Tulsa really allowed to provide any relief in the wake of a massacre, gave estimates by others of something like between 300 and 400 dead, though they themselves declined to suggest any number of their own. Some limited surveying of suspected locations of mass graves has taken place decades after the fact. And though none of these surveys have revealed any conclusive evidence either way, very, very generally, though, we are talking about a city of around 100,000 people that is about 10% African American. Several hundred or perhaps a thousand are now dead. Thousands more are wounded. More or less the entire black population of Tulsa homeless. Tens of thousands of people. 
Few black property owners had insurance, and those with policies contained clauses that voided them in the case of rioting. Unless you could prove in a court of law that public officials were derelict in their duties, this was basically impossible. In no small part because the history was already being written to suit Tulsa's white population. In the papers, marauding rioters were called patrols, white murderers called soldiers or riflemen, black people called snipers, rebels, or worse. As the summer of 1921 passed into fall and then into winter, many families were still living in tents on their plots, slowed in their efforts to rebuild by the machinations of the city fathers, who wanted to redevelop the land, sans black people of course, and turned away nearly all offers of aid from other cities across the nation. Restrictive fire codes designed not for safety, but to discourage rebuilding and drive out the town's black population for good it took years to overturn in the courts. Not a single monetary claim was ever paid, or has ever been paid, by the city, state, or any insurance company to any black person for any injuries or damage suffered throughout this event. Though a white gun store owner whose stock was looted by the mob was duly paid, no prosecution has ever taken place for any perpetrators of the riot. Well into the 1970s, magazines and newspapers refused to publish accounts, photographs, or any scholarship on the massacre to a popular audience. Henry C. Whitlow Jr., a teacher at Booker T. Washington High School in the 1970s in Tulsa, and Mozilla Franklin Jones, a member of the Tulsa Historical Society, a society that she helped desegregate, both encountered explicit pressure, particularly from white people, go figure, to stop publicizing accounts and evidence of the massacre. Pressure they resisted, and good on them for it. Because of them and the efforts of people like them, in 2001, the state of Oklahoma's appointed commission released a report on the massacre, long suppressed in history curricula and scholarship, both passively and actively. The evidence they collected led them to recommend five actions for the state to take, listed in order of priority. 1. Direct reparations to survivors. 2. Direct reparations to the descendants of survivors. 3. A scholarship fund. 4. Economic development in Greenwood. 5. A memorial service for the reburial of the victims. Greenwood has received a little bit of outside investment, and there is a memorial in John Hope Reconciliation Park in Tulsa, and around 300 scholarships do exist for the descendants of Greenwood residents. And that's it. Despite the machinations of the time, Greenwood did rebuild and become a thriving African-American community once more. For example, because I like music history, I'll tell you that a few years later, things had bounced back enough in Tulsa that a young black man named William would hear Walter Page and his famous Blue Devils play Tulsa. He got super into them. A few months later, he was in the band and calling himself Count Basie, on his way to becoming one of the most famous, talented, and influential American musicians of any color. In the end, it wasn't the brutal and direct looting, pillaging, and burning of Greenwood that ended that community, but the end of Jim Crow and the arrival of the highways built through town. I do not want to put down the efforts of those who've sought to make Greenwood something like what it once was, a symbol of stability and beauty and justice for people greatly in need of such symbols, but Greenwood is largely devoid of the descendants of the people who lived there in 1921 today. White supremacy in America has never been a problem for the quote, black community to solve. Well-meaning and even courageous people, both white and black, since the end of the United States Civil War and Reconstruction, have been exhorting black people to work harder, study harder, just be more white, in so many words. This advice is problematic enough in its ambiguity and poses further difficulties when you encounter events like in Tulsa, as May became June, and Greenwood became a ruin.
How could these people have done better? When in the space of a generation, Greenwood had gone from quiet freedom colony of a few dozen families to a bustling neighborhood of tens of thousands. It's probably the highest concentration of black-owned businesses in the entire nation. Their schools taught chemistry and Latin. Their libraries' collections grew every year. Their congregations funded beautiful new churches. Some of them became lawyers, doctors, pharmacists, accountants. A few even attained that sacred level of capitalist and became owners rather than laborers, rentiers rather than renters. And of what profit was all of this activity on the day of the disaster? I want to give you one more quote, again by Miss Mary Parrish, that teacher who lived in Greenwood on that fateful day. Quote, Some of our group feel their superiority over those less fortunate. But when a supreme test, like the Tulsa disaster, comes, it serves to remind us that we are all one race. That human fiends, like those who had full sway on June 1st, have no respect of person. Every Negro was accorded the same treatment, regardless of his education or other advantages. A Negro was a Negro on that day, and was forced to march for blocks with his hands up that day. It should teach us to remember that we cannot rise higher than our weakest brother. End quote. Well said. I know not whether by we she meant black people or all people. It's a fine admonition in either case. For my part, I choose to believe in this promise for all people. That we, humanity, can never rise higher than our weakest companions. Capitalism as practiced in America has never worn down the barriers and violence of white supremacy. On the contrary, more often than not, it's exacerbated things and relies upon racial explanations and politics to justify and maintain its systems. If we are all truly one race, and I believe that we are, then why are some of us poor and exploited? Why is our poverty and exploitation increased on the basis of gender, race, sexuality, education, religion, language, what have you? And why do others of humanity simultaneously grow ever more wealthy, almost always due to the connections and inheritances of past generations? Why do those of wealth resist so vehemently taking this next step that if we are all one people, Regardless of any circumstances of fate and birth, perhaps we are all equally entitled to enjoy the world's bounty. The answer is obvious, of course, because this concentration of wealth and power requires them to deny all that if they want to keep both their money and a clean conscience. They will deny us this unity based upon race or gender, language, religion, culture, Genetics, biology generally, whatever their angle, they'll all choose one. All to explain how no, you stupid socialists, we aren't all one people, not really. Some of us own, others of us work, and those who do the owning will decide how this all works, as we almost always have. Thank you very much. In 1921, the tools for enforcing this point of view were bloodier and cruder than today's the philosophy and language less sophisticated. But the central message, that capitalism is not a vehicle of liberation, not a tool to demolish racism in America, should be taken seriously. Money isn't truly colorblind in America, it never has been. Which is why there is no such thing as Black Wall Street anymore. Thank you for listening. This one took a little longer and is a little longer than I normally like to go. And I had to read through a lot of racial slurs in the research material composing this. So if you want to thank me for reading all those racial slurs so that you don't have to 
Patreon.com slash distant peasant. PayPal.me slash distant peasant. See you next time.